English here at St. Francis, and director of the Honors Program. And uh, today is with great pleasure that uh, we welcome uh, Paul Eli, author of The Life You Saved Maybe Your Own, An American Pilgrimage. Uh, as many of you know, in my classes here, the English 4005 seminar, uh, this book um, really inspired this seminar. Uh, four years ago was the first offering, and it's the second time that it's been offered. But uh, Paul's book explores the intersecting lives of uh, Dorothy Day, uh, Thomas Merton, Walker Percy, and Flannery O'Connor. Um, and as, as many of you have read the biography, as my students have, um, all of us, in a sense, were really impressed with the way Paul was able to weave these narratives together effortlessly and to kind of create a real uh, dramatic uh, story in the internet connecting lives of these four writers, 20th century Catholics, who, in a sense, really kind of uh, revitalized uh, an American Catholic tradition. Um, so we're really eager to, to hear Paul's thoughts about the subject. He's going to give a, a short lecture and then open the floor up for questions. So without further ado, Paul Eli. Thank you, Professor Maloney. Can everybody hear me? I'm pleased to be here at St. Francis. I live in Fort Greene, just up the hill, and pass by the campus fairly often. And uh, just take note of the life of the place, and for that reason also, I'm glad to be here. I'm here because of this book, which, as Ian made clear, is a book about four great American writers, four American Catholic writers. It's a book about reading and writing, and it's a book about pilgrimage, what a pilgrimage is, about their pilgrimage, and the broader pilgrimage of American Catholics, and how that comes to bear on our own pilgrimage as readers and writers. The four writers, Dorothy Day, Thomas Merton, Walker Percy, and Flannery O'Connor. A friend came up with a moniker for them, the School of the Holy Ghost. And this had to do with the fact that they were Catholic writers. Writers who, as one of them put it, Walker Percy, had a predicament shared in common. And what was that predicament? It was the predicament of uh, trying to make the American Catholic outlook uh, credible, sensible, uh, authentically literary in a society that uh, wasn't necessarily uh, congenial to their doing so. They did so in distinctly, some would say radically different ways. Dorothy Day, the founders of the Catholic Worker, was a journalist. She was born not far from here on Pineapple Street in Brooklyn Heights. Uh, lived in San Francisco, in Chicago, in New York. Uh, moved in circles of radical politics uh, for complicated reasons. Uh, had a child baptized, became a Catholic, sought to do something with that, and founded the Catholic Worker. First of all, as a newspaper, and only later as a movement that uh, sheltered the homeless, uh, fed the hungry, and undertook direct action for peace and against war in this country. But, as I say, she was a journalist. She wrote uh, thousands of newspaper columns for the Catholic Worker, published many thousands more. Her journals and letters have come out just in the time since my book was published, and they make all the more clear what a writer and a writer in the American grain she was. Thomas Merton, best known as the author of the autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain, one of the most notable American Catholic autobiographies. It tells the story of how he, also living in New York, uh, came to recognize a calling to be a monk, a Trappist monk in Kentucky, and right on the eve of World War II, uh, followed that call from New York on various uh, train lines down to Kentucky, and stayed at that monastery more or less for the rest of his life couple of trips out of the monastery and then a unprecedented trip to the Far East in 1968 where he wound up being electrocuted and dying in 1968. The Seven Story Mountain made him famous, but after that he thought when he was going into the monastery he was going to stop writing. Uh, it turns out that he wrote, by some estimates, about 60 books while he was in the monastery. A varying quality. He drew a chart of his work and it looked like a, an electrocardiogram. You know, some some high points and some low points and a lot of books in the middle. The Seven Story Mountain, I think, was in the middle for him. But there were other books that he thought he'd really found his voice in. So 
intending to go silent as a Trappist monk. Trappists don't um, speak except out of necessity. He wound up writing 60 books and going through many changes as a writer. Walker Percy was the son of a distinguished Southern family. Distinguished means they had a lot of money and land and uh, political positions in Mississippi. He was an orphan at a relatively young age. His father committed suicide. His mother drove a car off a bridge in a mysterious accident that others, some people think, may have um, had a suicidal aspect to it also. So Percy and uh, brothers were raised by a man they called Uncle Will. He was a cousin of theirs who ran the plantation of the Percy family in Greenville, Mississippi. Now Percy noted that his uh, uncle was cultivated, distinguished, knew about music, knew about uh, literature, knew about politics, and also he noted that his uncle was very unhappy. Uh, the only time he saw his uncle happy was uh, when World War II broke out. Suddenly in this most awful of times, this old fellow was animated and uh, saw a purpose to life that he hadn't seen before. So Percy, in a way, felt the necessity of uh, distinguishing himself from his forebears because among his forebears he had people who had killed themselves and a man in whom home, home he was living who was pretty miserable. And so he sought in different ways to uh, to effect an escape from the, the press of Southern gentility. First of all, it was by becoming a, a med medical doctor, a scientific person. Did that. He wound up working at uh, Bellevue Hospital on the east side of Manhattan in the tuberculosis ward, and he himself contracted tuberculosis. He went upstate, up near Saranac Lake in New York, and at that time, still the case, but especially then, the fresh air cure was considered to be the best treatment for tuberculosis. You uh, didn't uh, have much activity, you spent a lot of time out in fresh cold air, and you did a lot of reading and spent a lot of time on your back lying about and thinking. Well, he did that and read a lot of philosophical novels and works of philosophy. In effect, he laid down a um, medical doctor and got up a novelist. And another 10 years followed in which he tried to figure out what kind of novelist he was going to be. And the idea he got was that he would be a diagnostic novelist, that he would try to figure out what ailed society through literature. Instead of being uh, the kind of, instead of figuring out what ailed individual people, he would try to figure out what ailed the human person in our time. But he realized he didn't really have a sense of what civilization's conception of a person who was well was like. And it's a long story, but he found that conception very distinctly expressed in uh, the Catholic religion. And that was, was for him a kind of standard and a vision of the human person uh, broken but fixed. Broken by sin, fixed by uh, faith in the sacraments, etc., and by redemption. Uh, and with that in mind, he then stopped writing philosophy and started writing novels, best known of which is his first, The Moviegoer, published in 1961. Flannery O'Connor, the youngest of the four, born in 1925, uh, you know, she, there are people, there are working writers who are more or less her contemporaries who are still still at it today. Uh, she died in 1964 of lupus. In 39 years, she wrote one of the most significant bodies of work of any modern American writer. Two books of short stories, uh, two novels, a book of essays that, in my mind, is the best uh, book about f fiction that I've ever read, uh, and a uh, a substantial volume of letters, the habit of being. And O'Connor, she was a, uh, raised as a Catholic in the South where there are very few Catholics. And so her, her wish as a writer was to uh, write about a world that was not like the world she lived in mentally uh, in such a way as so that they might meet. And a novel like Wise Blood, it's very much a Southern novel and it's very much a European existential novel, or a northern philosophical novel, or a Catholic novel, as much as it is about the South. So these four writers, working in their different ways to make uh, credible, distinctly American Catholic literature in the middle of the century, their stories converged. They met, they wrote letters, they read one another's books, uh, they heard about each other's doings second and third hand, and they were it took a kind of consolation and satisfaction in the knowledge that they were not working alone, that the others were out there. 
these four great writers were also great readers. And that's, for me, where I enter the story and also where the notion of pilgrimage uh, is deepened or amplified. What does it mean to be a great reader? Well, these four writers read their way into the callings of the literary careers that were theirs and read their way into a conception of the Catholic faith that made sense to them. Dorothy Day was a radical. Uh, she was accused by other radicals of being too religious. Uh, she wound up moving away from the community of Lower East Side radicals and into the community of uh, working class Catholics in Lower Manhattan. Her feeling was, well, the radicals want to help uh, the poor and the working class, but the working class is actually more drawn to the church than to uh, the radical parties. Uh, why is that? Uh, it's complicated how she worked that out, but she wound up uh, reading her way through anarchist and radical literature toward the Gospels. And the Gospels for her said, uh, well, look, Christ was poor, and you're enjoined to treat the poor person as Christ. Uh, what's more radical than that? With that credo, she was joined to the poor around the world in faith. And so through that reading of the Gospel as a radical text, uh, she was emboldened to found the Catholic worker and to, to do the things that she did for the next uh, 45 years. Merton was reading medieval philosophy up at Columbia, and he was stunned reading the Catholic encyclopedia to realize that uh, there were places uh, right here in America where something like medieval philosophy was still uh, lived out on a daily basis. These places, of course, are called monasteries. There was a particularly medieval one uh, in Kentucky called the Abbey of Our Lady of Gethsemane. He went there and he said, this is the true center of America. And you imagine the rest of the country revolving around this still point where people uh, were devoted to praying uh, at ritual times you know, for most of the day. Robert Giroux, who was Merton's editor and friend, explained it to me this way. I mean, I've given you a kind of religious account of how to see medieval philosophy made actual in a monastery, to see a book come alive there was tremendously powerful for him. Well, Giroux said, Merton was so, he was like a, a young guy with ADD. He was so distracted and so abuzz with ideas that he needed the discipline and quiet and order of a monastery even to think straight. And that's what explains why once he was enveloped by the ritual silence of the monastery, his literary works started to come forth. So he read his way through medieval philosophy into a way of life, that of the monk, that was distinctly, that was really his calling. I think uh, in a late book he said, I have to question uh, um, to what extent, people will question to what extent I'm a Catholic or to what extent uh, uh, my writing is Catholic writing, but he knew that he was a monk and he knew that he was a writer. And he, so he read his way into a monastic uh, life. Percy, when he was flat on his back in uh, Saranac Lake in the sanatorium, he was literally saved by literature. He was trying to figure out what to do with his life and what to do with his life as a survivor of tuberculosis. He read European novels about uh, metaphorically sick people like uh, Sartre and Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground and Camus, and he recognized his own Southern American situation in those European novels. So then he tried to affect the transposition of European existentialism into American literature by way of Catholicism, and in doing that discovered a really distinctive idiom, the idiom that is found in The Moviegoer. The Moviegoer, I think, is the first contemporary American novel. That's the way I see it. It's in the present tense. The narrator binks bawling. He's 30 years old and he doesn't know what to do with his life. We would call him a slacker. Uh, and the affectless quality of his narration and the way things follow one another in herky-jerky fashion prefigures a lot of subsequent American fiction. And he found his way to that. He read his way to it there in the sanatorium. And O'Connor, as a Catholic in the South, how did she wind up writing work that is now the byword for Catholic literature? Uh, in a place where there were few priests, few churches, few Catholic schools, uh, there weren't universities like this one, uh, et cetera, et cetera. She did it through 
a recognition that the people in rural Georgia, where she'd grown up, and where she'd returned to live and write, were akin to the people in the Hebrew Bible, in the older books of the Bible. Uh, living in a rural, a desert society, working out their religious problems uh, in, in clans, really, in very tightly knit communities, and from time to time uh, pointing their questions about the meaning of life you know, right at God, uh, right at, uh, without the mediation of a church or a surrounding culture. She found in that, in the Bible, that is, a literary model for her own work about the modern South. So reading through scripture, she figured out how to tell the stories of people in her own place and time. This is, this I submit is what it means to be a great reader. These are people who read their way to their own lives and read their way to their own literary callings. Well, what does it mean for us to read with our lives? I have a couple of ideas about what that means um, that I had to figure out in writing the book. Because I realized, uh, I had pretty early on the notion that this book would be about pilgrimage. Because pilgrimage is a motif that figures into their works repeatedly. Dorothy Day's column for the Catholic Worker for 40 of its 50 years was called On Pilgrimage. There's a biography of Walker Percy called Pilgrim in the Ruins. Thomas Merton wrote an important essay called From Pilgrimage to Crusade, which really diagnoses how uh, a sensible religion that's ambitious for good social change uh, turns into something else, a religion that's uh, forcibly imposing its views on others without um, a sense of their freedom. So pilgrimage is all through their works. My book is going to be about pilgrimage. Well, then I realized, well, I don't really know what pil a pilgrimage is. I looked around, and I didn't find a satisfactory definition, one that seemed to, uh, uh, to support the uses of the term as it showed up in their work. So I looked at their work and tried to derive uh, a working idea of pilgrimage from it. And this is what I came up with. A pilgrimage is a journey taken in the light of a story. The story precedes us. We've read it, we've heard it, in many instances we've been raised in it. Well, at some point we need to test that story with our own experience, to read it with our lives, you might say, and to make it our own. The pilgrimage, whether Dante's pilgrimage or our own, has certain distinguishing features. The pilgrim sets out on a path that others have taken, sets out to see what others have seen, but with his or her own eyes. And this is important. Uh, pilgrims travel in company, you know, famously as in Chaucer, but each must encounter the holy site individually. Finally, the pilgrims on their return tell others what they've seen and heard. And that's part of the pilgrimage that you, you pass it on by telling the story of your pilgrimage to others. And that, that, as I understand it, is the pattern of pilgrimage. And this book is an effort to see the lives of these four great American Catholic writers as a pilgrimage through the 20th century, in which they took the models of European Christianity, which they found best expressed in certain books, and made them their own, and made them our own in the circumstances of 20th century uh, America. So there's a pilgrimage writ large, or writ religiously, or writ in terms of the lives of these writers. And what does it mean for us and for our lives as readers? Well, pilgrimage is a journey taken in the light of a story. Uh, they sought to have the pilgrim effect uh, through their writing. They sought to, having been on pilgrimage, they sought to uh, tell the story so that it would um, lead others into the story uh, through the power of the writing. And Merton did that famously in the Seven Story Mountain, to the extent that years after the book came out, people would go to the monastery spontaneously, suddenly seized by the wish or the calling to become monks, and they would want to meet Thomas Merton when they got there. And you forget that he was busy praying or writing or doing whatever else he was doing. The, they were sufficiently moved by the book to, uh, to go to the monastery and, and try to join in. Likewise with Dorothy Day. She was the publisher of the Catholic Worker newspaper. Uh, it was a newspaper that had as its, not stated aim, but its understated aim, 
the wish to embody the community of the Catholic worker in prose, so that reading the paper you felt joined to the community as if you were there serving soup on the line, or um, finding housing for people without housing, etc. And boy did it succeed. How many writers in America have entire movements with 150 branches committed to carrying out uh, their worldly work? Not so many. That's what Dorothy Day did through her writing. She brought others into the story. <coughs> Walker Percy, 60 years after the moviegoer, that, as I said before, is the book that started what I consider post-war American literature going. And out of, the, out of this novel came many subsequent novels. Does anyone know Richard Ford's book, The Sports Writer? The Sports Writer is modeled on the moviegoer, which was modeled on The Stranger. So you have Camus, The Stranger, influences the moviegoer, right down to the title. And Percy's The Moviegoer leads Richard Ford to write The Sports Writer, which is expressly modeled on the moviegoer. This is how the pattern of pilgrimage works. And Flannery O'Connor, the youngest uh, living American writer to be honored with the Library of America edition. Uh, this is a writer who, in some ways, is one of the most imperious and forbidding of American writers, and yet everybody calls her Flannery. Uh, she's managed to establish a dialogue between readers and writers of an intimacy that I don't uh, know exists with many other writers. Her book of letters, The Habit of Being, it's over 500 pages. The letters are addressed to various people, but my suggestion in the book is that they're addressed to us. She knew she wasn't going to live uh, in some respects. She needed to explain herself, so she did it in the form of letters which were addressed to her future readers, that is, to us. That's how the pattern of pilgrimage works in literature, uh, how writers pass on their stories. You know, I speak from experience here in the sense that I was compelled to tell the story, to move the story forward by writing this book. But I think that that's the effect that literature in general uh, has on us. There are certain books that we read with our lives. We're reading them for a class, or we're reading them to be entertained, or we're reading them to learn something about the world we live in. But we're really reading them to, uh, we're looking for a clue as to how to live our lives and what our lives are about. I don't want to say an answer in the sense of self-help literature, but if we can't be put on the path by great literature, uh, what, what can we be put on the path by? So I would suggest that uh, there's certain kinds of great works, some fiction, non-fiction, some poetry, some cultural biography, some uh, pol political, that you would understand as wisdom literature. And these are books that we read with our lives. Walker Percy characterized a uh, the effect of literature that he wanted to have as the effect of a message in a bottle. And what does that mean? The message in the bottle, I think, is from Robinson Crusoe. The uh, castaway puts a message in a bottle and puts the cork in it, tosses it into the ocean, hoping that it will wash up on some far shore, and the person will take the cork out, take the message out, and uh, get the communication from this from this castaway. Well, that's in some ways how uh, books work. A book is generally written by a person alone in a room, and generally read by a person alone in a room. Uh, this is really distinct from the other arts. Theaters, communal, music, it takes certain uh, musicians to make the work, and uh, it's often played in front of an audience, uh, etc. A book typically is written by a person alone in a room, and read by a person alone in a room. And this I mean, to be the author of a book talking about it with people who've read it alone in their rooms, you, you feel the uh, profundity of this experience, that this thing you made in your apartment is suddenly out there and people are, are having it on their desks or reading it. Uh, and it also, I think, explains the power that certain books have over us. There's a directness to the communication because it's written by one person, in effect, for one person. Books aren't experienced in groups the way plays are. You, you know, those of you who are Professor Maloney's students uh, discuss the book in class, but I'm willing to bet you read it individually on your own. So there's a great power to that uh, kind of communication. A writer alone in a room, writing to a reader alone in a room, and together they uh, uh, come to some sort of um, encounter over the common story. That's how the p pattern of pilgrimage works in published literature, and that 
I hope is an effect that you've either had with one of these four writers or can recognize in your own writing. I guess with that in mind, that's where it seems a good point to open to questions. Yes. Yes. So, what, what is the American Catholic experience then? Is there something that ties that together with all four of them? What, what is, is there a Catholic imagination or something that you're trying to bring out? Or what, what is uh, your answer? Yes, uh, there definitely is. This is the mother of all questions. You know, what is the American Catholic experience and is there a Catholic imagination? What I would suggest th is that Yes, there is, but the way to understand it is uh, not through an act of definition, but through the, um, by dramatizing it. That's what I tried to do with the book. Catholic uh, implies multiform or plural in the old uh, s s sense of the word. And so the fascination for me in writing the book was to see how the Catholic imagination took uh, related but different forms in the lives of these four writers. An issue would come up like uh, the Vietnam War or uh, nuclear weapons or race relations, and the four different writers would have distinctly um, Catholic answers to it, but also answers that were distinctly informed by their own experience. So by putting these four writers together in the book, it was trying to suggest a unity and uh, within a variety of uh, Catholic experience and Catholic imagination, and then to suggest that that somehow is distinctly Catholic. That's what, in Catholicism, there's the, uh, it's understood that we're, we come to recognition of uh, the meaning of the gospel through the lives of uh, certain holy people that are called saints. And the Protestant tradition has often had problems with this. Why don't you just go directly uh, to the gospels? But the Catholic tradition recognizes that uh, these stories of several thousand diverse people can shed light on that, those, that story of the gospel. So in that respect, these four, you know, call them like four evangelists or four saints or four what have you, but it's to try to suggest the Catholic experience um, in all its density through, frankly, a long book. So if there's a Catholic imagination, there's also a Protestant imagination, a Jewish imagination, right? well, what, what is the thing that well, it's interesting that you ask that, because I think that, uh, I don't think you can s simply say there is a Catholic imagination, a Protestant imagination, a Jewish imagination. I think that there are, uh, in each of those remarkably complex traditions, there are certain um, distinguishing features. Uh, Protestantism is itself very diverse. Judaism has an internal diversity. Catholicism has an internal diversity uh, that is at different points um, recognized and at different points uh, not recognized or suppressed. Uh, I'm writing now a book about J.S. Bach and the way Bach's music has been um, interpreted uh, over and over again since the 30s and made, um, made vital again through the encounter of musicians with new technology like radio, the LP, tape decks, uh, DVDs, etc. And the pattern that runs through the book uh, is how again and again these musicians revive the music of Bach or are thought to revive something that's in danger of dying. Uh, oh, great, the LP comes along. Classical music is going out of vogue, but we can re revive it with this new format. And so we'll re-record all the great works on LPs and spread, spread the worried about the greatness of this work that way. Well, that is a distinctly Protestant note, the note of revival. The revivalist uh, tradition in uh, Protestantism is very strong. This, there's a, a rhetoric of revival that says something is about to die out and people, you gotta get with it and revive it because we're gonna save this thing before it goes out of existence. It's a, uh, I wouldn't say that's uh, exclusive to Protestantism or that it's the only thing thing about Protestantism, but it, to explore that impulse across 20th century uh, arts in light of the work of the 
arguably the greatest Protestant artist who ever lived, Johann Sebastian Bach, you start getting all sorts of resonances and correspondences that suggest uh, the way a Protestant imagination works. Yes? about Catholicism. So I was saying in the classroom uh, earlier that what led me to these writers in the first place was a um, confusion or let's say a cognitive dissonance between what I read about Catholicism, which mentioned its eternal and unchanging character, the uh, mystery of its liturgies and the uh, uh, the Latin uh, inflections and the soutained priests and uh, long lines um, out the door of the church on Friday nights of people going to confession and so forth. And what I knew as the everyday reality of Catholicism in the 80s, which was of bright churches, folk masses, um, communion, which was done with two folding chairs uh, in the sacristy, uh, mass in English, which began with a joke about the football game that was going to follow the mass, Etc. There was a dissonance between Catholicism as it was encountered, you know, in discussions of Dante or whatever, and the Catholicism I'd grown up with that I saw on the streets in New York. I was eager to f to try to f figure out how these um, two sets of examples were connected, and it led me, because I was an aspiring writer, I suppose it was natural for me to look to books and to literary books to. Um, to sort things out. It began with Merton, and he was a good a guide in that respect because he, this man who uh, wound up expressly trying to live a neo-medieval existence at a Trappist monastery was the most with it college student in New York of the 30s that you could imagine. He went to jazz clubs on 52nd Street every night. He uh, bought books in the bookstores. He hung out in the village. He had a phonograph and listened to Big Spiderbeck records, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you could see in his life a, an attempt to reconcile um, his own modernism and uh, his own uh, yearning uh, for an older and deeper tradition. And I did something like that, working through Flannery O'Connor, and then Dorothy Day, and then Walker Percy. And uh, yes, it makes much more sense to me now. Uh, but at the time, I, I was frankly bewildered. And the books uh, I mentioned in the classroom that there's a significance to the title, The Life You Save May Be Your Own, that in some sense it sounds presumptuous. We're looking to, for a kind of, to be saved in a way by great books, and great books of a certain kind, and the, these writers, I was really saved by the works of these writers from a, from a kind of confusion. Let's see. I f felt a real pressure to get things right and also to tell the truth. I think there's um, the, 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 the you know, Catholic culture suffers from an, uh, all sorts of problems about silence and things that aren't said, uh, culminating in the crisis of sexual abuse and the uh, way it's been covered up by the bishops over the years. So uh, there was a, a burden to make sure that the truth was told in the story. Walker Percy had an affair that's also... Um, dramatized in the book. Dorothy Day had an abortion. Um, Flannery O'Connor uh, spoke um, in, the, in the meanest, crudest terms about um, African Americans. Uh, Thomas Merton fathered an illegitimate child, as they were called, which was killed in the Blitz and then had an affair with a nurse uh, while he was a Trappist monk in the 60s. There, those things are left out of many stories. Dorothy Day in The Long Loneliness says, in one of the great uh, acts of reticence of modern memoir, about the next few years, there's little to say. And she was uh, married, traveling in Europe, um, involved in a uh, kind of awful love affair that led to the um, unborn child, uh, etc. About the next few years, there's little to say. As a person telling their stories, I'm obligated to enter the truth into the record. That said, 
I think um, it's important not to just uh, um, stand up in the middle of the story and wag a finger. One of the most profound things about Dorothy Day, for example, is that uh, um, her experience of having an abortion uh, led her to, in part, to a life of hospitality, trying to um, welcome other people through the Catholic worker. But I searched her writings, and there's very uh, little or nothing to be said in um, judgment about other people and their abortions. And in a way, uh, it was very hard on this point, because I don't want to um, uh, want to make sure to represent the story in its fullness. And it may be that the letters and uh, diaries that have since been published deepen her testimony. But she did not become an anti-abortion activist. Uh, she um, moved into the works of mercy in other areas, certainly with what she considered a, um, an evil act in mind, but uh, not uh, Dorothy Day, the anti-abortion activist, is not, not to be found in my experience. Yes? I wanted to piggyback on the uh, definition you gave from what a pilgrimage is. Uh, what's your path that you have taken on, on Catholicism since you wrote Life you saved me. So how, how is uh, my own um, uh, religious life followed on the book? Right. Well, let's see. Uh, I'm a parishioner at uh, St. Boniface uh, around you know, the other side of um, over on Willoughby and past J Street. The experience of writing a book and trying to uh, come to a reckoning with these four writers and also with the Catholic tradition strengthen my sense of, uh, of myself as a Catholic, um, but also was a reminder of how um, difficult it has always been uh, f to be a Catholic and how, how much in, in everyday religious experience gives the lie to, uh, to the truths of the gospel and the teachings of the church. That's true in all eras and in all places. Um, Cardinal Spellman, uh, at many points, um, opposed the Catholic worker uh, because he uh, was a staunch advocate of the war in Vietnam, because he, uh, although the Catholic Church had been strongly in support of the labor movement in this country, um, he uh, took a strong position against the uh, Union organized group of uh, cemetery workers here in New York. Uh, Dorothy Day, um, when it, when there was a threat that the Catholic worker would be closed by the archdiocese, uh, she said, um, "Well, they can go ahead and close us, uh, but we will be uh, on Mass in St. Patrick's Cathedral first. Uh, Thomas Merton's stories of his struggles with various abbots over the freedom to say this or that thing. Um, totally take over some of the biographies of, of him. I tried to keep it to a minimum, but that's the main line of several 600-page books about him. Flannery O'Connor uh, was um, not um, recognized as a Catholic writer in her own time uh, for a bunch of reasons. Uh, one, um, even being a woman was in a disadvantage for her. Uh, the fact that she didn't write about Catholic characters, and uh, the fact that there was so much violence in her work, it was considered insufficiently um, good-mannered. Uh, you know, why do you have uh, a an escaped convict shooting a grandmother by the side of the road? That's Catholic literature, and in her um, brilliantly bold fashion, she insisted that it was. Walker Percy. Uh, wound up on the Pontifical Council for Culture, visiting John Paul II in Rome. Uh, but uh, his last um, book, which takes issues of abortion in the, into the story, does it in a very, very complicated way, involving um, doctors, uh, I think chemical dumping and nuclear safeguards, and, and lots of other themes. I'm a bit away from the question at this point, which is about my own religious pilgrimage. But the point I was trying to make is that knowing the story and having to tell the story for myself 
certainly strengthened my sense of myself as a Catholic, and my Catholic uh, belief, if you will. At the same time, it's been a reminder that um, it's, too e it's easy to say, well, these are horrible times to be a Catholic. There were difficulties in, in every time, and their stories are reminders of that. Yes? Were there, when you were doing the research for this book, were there any moments that surprised you about any of the four authors and realized their stories, and if so, what were they? In the, writing a, a book like this, the, the, the experience of surprise is what, what carries you through the book. In some ways, it was a low-level surprise. I mentioned in the classroom how, for me, in writing this kind of book, it's very important to know when things happened. And once you know when things happened, all sorts of uh, parallels and correspondences among the author or among the protagonists emerge. So it would be really surprising, for example, to learn that um, Dorothy Day was preparing a piece of writing about Saint Therese of Lisieux in New York at the same time as Flannery O'Connor in Georgia was uh, preparing a piece of writing about St. Therese of Lisieux. Or that Flannery O'Connor subscribed to the Catholic Worker and so got their annual Christmas card. And um, in many ways denounced the Catholic Worker, and especially Dorothy Day, she thought arrogant for coming to the South and presuming to speak about uh, race relations as a Northerner. But she took over a beautiful uh, prayer from one of the church fathers that was printed on the Catholic Worker's Christmas card and put it into um, a letter of her own in a way of unparalleled beauty to watch you know, a Christmas card sent from New York to Georgia by the movement associated with one writer show up in the writing of another writer, even though the other writer wasn't especially fond of the first writer. That's the kind of surprise that um, I would go into the other room where my wife was uh, doing whatever she was doing. I said, oh, you wouldn't believe what I just figured out. And that's when you know you're on the, the trail of something, when you keep having these surprises. Yes? There's a lot of young people here that probably haven't read any of these authors. Uh, would you suggest if there was one book, you know, along the four, that they might pick up to give them this sense, again, of going back to this notion of a Catholic imagination uh, that leads to a path that we all seek, as you mentioned before. Uh, what or a short story or whatever uh, might be recommended? I suggest Mystery and Manners. Its subtitle is Occasional Prose, and it was um, essays and talks that Flannery O'Connor gave, published posthumously. She died in 1964 and the book came out in 69 with the big peacock on the cover. I suggest it for a number of reasons. One is two-thirds of the book is addresses to groups like this one. She spoke at Catholic colleges and did it in a way that, uh, you know, she, she, she was a um, speaker of genius. And what she did with an hour like this one is evident in that book. So it speaks directly to students, and especially students of writing, in a way that is undiminished by the 50 years that have passed since she gave these talks. Secondly, the book is about the Catholic imagination. It's about the imagination of, the, of, a, of a Catholic who is an artist. So in that respect, it engages your question really uh, head on. Uh, number three, and three, 3A and 3B, it's pretty short and it's very funny. And you could just, you, you, you come away from this book not believing that these personal qualities and intellectual qualities can fit together in the way that they do. She's young, and yet she seems wiser than the oldest person. She's uh, from the South, and yet she feels more uh, Catholic and almost medieval than someone from, you know, Aquinas' Paris. Uh, she's... Um, sassy, and yet uh, she's full of reverence for people like Augustine and Flaubert. Uh, and she, just for example, she said um, uh, how curious she thought it was that um, to, to be a student and have writers come to address you. Because, of course, they would contradict each other. And what you heard one week from the elephant, uh, they were like animals coming to visit from the zoo. And what you heard one week from the elephant was bound to be uh, contradicted the next week by the baboon. 
And there's just quips like that all through the book. It's an extraordinary book, and it's the one that um, set me on this path more than any other. Yes? You mean your book, which I enjoy very much, and makes me feel very humble with this fellowship in that book, but you mentioned the, uh, at one point, the spirit of the medieval philosophy. By Etienne Gilles Song. Yeah, it was Burton. And I had to just wrote down a quote from you had in your book. The goal of life on Earth is the contemplation of the divine essence. I'm just wondering now, you talk about the unifying idea of the Catholic imagination among these uh, four orphans. Um, the stance of the church in the 20th century, especially the Spanish Civil War, you know, where they were on the side of Franco, uh, the toleration of uh, Hitler's Nazi Germany, the refusal to uh, really speak to the plight of the Jews, uh, whether that, that uh, disturbed these rights anywhere. I didn't see any evidence of that. That they reacted to that in a particular way. Well, let's see. So the, the, the Catholic Church, let's put it plainly, was on the wrong side of some of the main uh, um, social movements of the century. It got the Second World War wrong in many respects. It got the Spanish Civil War wrong. And what was the third one you mentioned? Uh, the toleration of that was Right. Uh, the, these writers... Um, A couple of them, Merton and Day, were really singular in their uh, departure from the, the behavior of the church as a whole. Thomas Merton was one of the few Catholic pacifists in this country at that time. And the drama of the Seven Story Mountain culminates in uh, his request for conscientious objection on the grounds that he's a pacifist, or that he, he nonviolent. I think that's a distinction that comes up much later in the book. Uh, and if he can um, be classified as a conscious objector because his Catholic, Catholic faith uh, forbids him uh, to support war in the way that the country was mobilizing for, how would he uh, serve instead? And so there were two ways he could do it. One was by working at Friendship House, which was a house um, that meant to ameliorate the ills of poverty in Harlem. And the other was by entering the Trappist Monastery. He wound up entering the Trappist Monastery. But before that, he went on the radio at the college radio station at St. Bonaventure and gave an impassioned address against war at a time when the whole country was mobilized for war, right around Pearl Harbor, and when the Catholic community was especially mobilized for war, and when the identification of uh, patriotism, uh, the Catholic cause, and what uh, the parish priest said you should do was, it was absolute. Dorothy Day, uh, the uh, literature of the Catholic worker was so staunchly opposed uh, to the atomic bomb uh, to, I mean, they were conscience objectors throughout World War II, and the story is told across about 50 pages in my book of how strongly they resisted it. Uh, I'm a little less um, well informed at eight years remove on her position in the Spanish Civil War, but I'm pretty sure she was against. Uh, Percy and O'Connor, um, per Percy was, had tuberculosis during the war. Uh, but I think you want me to speak to a general point. Was how, if the Catholic imagination has any value, how could the, wasn't it pretty unimaginative to support Hitler uh, and to support Franco? Uh, don't, don't these two things seem to contradict each other? I think they do, uh, but I don't think that I'm not willing to say that the whole tradition is invalidated by um, uh, by the wrongful acts of the church's leaders, and the fact that they, um, the fact that Pius XII got things wrong, um, makes it all the more important for Catholics today to uh, get things right as far as Catholic-Jewish relations. I published a piece in the New York Times Magazine in 1998 in which this is all spelled out in, in, uh, in a pretty great length. Today, where everything seems to come 
through a different lens, whether through social media or through, you know, Percy's essay really looks at can you ever look an experience with your own eyes without having some type of understanding of someone else has been there. Um, how is the experience, in a sense, the metaphor of pilgrimage, how do you think it is affected by you know, the, the advancements that we have and the kind of you know, multiple lenses and views that we have to go through in order to get an authentic experience? Let's see. Let me try to answer that in a couple of ways. One is in terms of Percy, and one is in terms of our experience. Percy, it's a brilliant essay, The Loss of the Creature, and he, he writes about the feeling of, um, that's familiar, often discussed today, about how much our experience is mediated by prior experiences. You, you go to see the Grand Canyon, and someone's already uh, sent you a picture of it. You can't see it because you feel the need to see it, see the, view, see the tourist view, and you can't really be there because your prior image of the thing um, interferes. So the first thing to say is that that essay, brilliant as it is, was an essay he was writing on his way to somewhere else. For him, the way out of that box of self-consciousness was to step out of himself altogether by writing a novel in which their protagonist was a character who was not himself. He switched from nonfiction to fiction, from writing about Walker Percy to writing about someone who was not himself, Binks Balling, and that was his way out. Uh, but in a twist, at the end of his story, he became so well known that it was hard for him to step out of himself in fiction, and so that predicament um, chased him down at the end of his life. Now, in terms of our experience, you think about uh, how mediated things are um, all the time. Uh, before we go see the movie, we already know that it has 5,879 likes on Facebook. We've, uh, ten little reviews have come into our phones, etc. cetera. Uh, to me, the pattern of pilgrimage is a reminder that, uh, of the other side of the coin, that the value uh, of, of having a story that precedes us that we seek to make our own. So the fact that other people have walked, um, have been in uh, Canterbury Cathedral, uh, yes, on the face of it, could invalidate me having a religious experience there. But the knowledge through the pattern of pilgrimage that many people have trodden that path, and yet it's not enough to go on that path just because others have gone on it. I have to seek to see it for myself. That, seek, that to me, suggests a level of responsibility, which is the way out of, um, of the trap of self-consciousness, if you will, that's created by uh, how much how mediated our experience is. In some ways it says, look, experience has always been mediated, and it, the challenge of being alive is to uh, find the way to ourselves, uh, you know, over and through that mediation. And that was true in a certain respect in the Middle Ages, and it was true in the time of Ignatius of Loyola, and true uh, in our own time. And, that, and that's the discussion of the mediated character of our society often doesn't leave room for free will or personal responsibility. Uh, you know, my phone is in my pocket, but I turned the ringer off. I turned the ringer off. You're not going to hear it. If I don't want to uh, know what um, everybody on Facebook says about that movie, I don't have to look. Uh, and that's really the next turn that our discussions about social media need to take is what, what, what is our responsibility for the um, you know, maintenance of our free will in this environment, and I think we have to be able to do it. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you.